I'll start by saying that disruption is always difficult. And uh, this disruption that we're undergoing right now is one of the largest ones, or maybe the largest one that our generation has ever faced. And we're all grappling with what's going on right now, the present, and also the future. What to do, what not to do, when to do it, and um, how to do what comes next. And today, we are gonna focus on what comes next. We hope that you leave today's summit with some inspiration, despite these really tough times. We're gonna focus on the positive changes that we're beginning to see and what more we'd like to see. And then we're going to figure out how we can innovate as we start to recover. My hope is that we will look back at 2020 as a year of reinvention and resilience, helping us move through the economic pain, the lives that we've lost in our region and our state, and the stress and the hardships that so many of us are, are dealing with right now. We've got some very interesting people on the panel today to offer us some inspiration for the future. And I'm gonna briefly introduce them, starting with Josh Broder. He is the CEO of Tilson, which is a telecommunications software and infrastructure company. He's a wildly successful entrepreneur. He grew the company from 10 employees to 500, which just about makes your eyes pop. He's also co-chairing co the Governor's Economic Recovery Committee, which has set out to develop policy to stabilize the state's economy and to build a bridge to future prosperity in the wake of our COVID-19 crisis. Next, we have Dr. Dora Ann Mills. Many of us know her and love her. Uh, she, we had her last year at the summit, so many of you experienced her wisdom there. She is right now the Chief Health Improvement Officer at Maine Health, Maine's largest health system. Um, and she's been front and center during this pandemic. She's been drawing on her 15 years as the CDC Director for Governors King and Baldacci. And I'm gonna do a little plug for her since she won't do it, which is that she's got a great Facebook feed. If you don't follow her, she's got great advice on the pandemic. Um, Tony Payne is next. He's the Senior Vice President for External Affairs at Memic, uh, which provides workers' compensation insurance for I, I'm sure many people in this room, this virtual room. He's also the chair of the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce's Advocacy Committee, which has adopted expanding public transportation and housing choices and top priorities for this region. So Tony and I, I have had the chance to work very closely on issues. Um, I consider Tony one of the region's top thought leaders on how to improve the climate for businesses, but also make sure that we're sharing prosperity that benefits all people in our region. And lastly, we have Hannah Pingree. She is the director of the Governor's Office of Policy and Innovation in the Future. She's leading a lot, I don't know how she does it, a lot of critical initiatives for the state, including co-chairing the Climate Council, responding to the opioid misuse health crisis, expanding early childhood education. She is a woman with a lot on her plate. And I'm thrilled that she can join us because I always learn something from Hannah when we have her on the panel. Um, so we are gonna focus on kind of an optimistic tone, but I am gonna start with some sobering, with a sober question for all of you. Um, the world, as we know, was not perfect before the pandemic. Um, I'd like to hear from you what challenges you think have been thrown into greater relief. What do we see more clearly now that have been challenges that we need to address as a state and as a region in the wake of this disease? And I would be happy for you just to unmute yourselves, all of you, and just jump in. Whoever would like to go first I'll, just, I'll kick it off to get it over All right, with. thanks, Hannah. Christina, it's great to be here and it's great to be with all of you and thank you all for all the work you're doing during an incredibly uh, challenging time. Um, so, I mean, I think obviously nobody needs to be told how challenging a period it is for um, Maine people, for governments, both the state government and local governments. And I think we're all trying to do our best to muddle through a situation that is absolutely unprecedented. Um, I would say that it throws many things into greater focus for all of us. I mean, clearly the issues of inequities, the challenges um, of our economy are now being felt um, most acutely by the people who've lost their jobs, the people whose housing is most at risk, the people um, who are really at the edge. And, and that situation is likely to get worse before it gets better. And I'm working closely with Josh on that. And, and I hopefully he'll talk a little bit more about that, that work. Um, we work a lot on the issues of climate change. And I know that this group has has really um, has has weighed into that challenge in a way that the state greatly appreciates. Um, I would say while the this crisis is, is certainly not about climate, the need to prepare our communities for resiliency, um, to to listen to scientists 
and make sure we respond to what they're telling us well in advance, um, that is certainly in greater focus. And you know, while, while people um, are just focused on how they're going to make it through the next couple of weeks, next couple of months, um, we, we do know that people are saying to us very clearly that climate and preparing Maine for climate and finding ways um, to mitigate the challenge is just as important as it was before. So um, we're excited to tackle all of these challenges. And again, um, they're really important ones that we figure out how to engage many types of people across our state in. That's great. And Hannah, we're going to come back to uh, climate in a little while. And I'm going to ask you just to keep yourselves unmuted so that you can respond to each other and just uh, go ahead and just jump right in. So who would like to go next? Um, what's been thrown into relief, relief? What have we seen that's more clear now? I'd be happy to share um, you know, some inf infrastructure challenges that we've seen. So if before COVID came down the line, there was a lot of discussion in Maine about broadband. Um, and one of the challenges we have in Maine is that there's places that still don't have adequate broadband. And the very definition of what adequate broadband means um, has been, been thrown in a really great relief by people working from home. So I live in Portland um, and I've, I've got two kids doing school remotely and my wife and I are working from home. And I would say we have crummy broadband. It's insufficient uh, to, to really participate. And so if you can imagine that if that's a problem on the peninsula in Portland, uh, it gets to be a real problem, you know, even, even in most parts of Southern Maine. So that, that infrastructure gap, is a pre-existing problem and it's been exacerbated by the crisis. Thanks, Josh. And I, I've heard also Belinda Ray, who you just heard from, had shared with me that, that even in Portland, we have broadband infrastructure that is subpar to many developing countries. True story. Wow. True story. Great. Dora, you look like you're about to jump in. Sure. <laughs> Well, I'll springboard off from what I think Hannah was mentioning and also thank everybody for everything you've been doing to support our municipalities and, and our region. Um, I think one of the things uh, from a health public health standpoint that all pandemics seem to bring into striking relief, and this is no exception, are the health disparities that we see. Um, the data yesterday from Maine CDC showing that 25% of all of the cases of COVID in Maine are from racial minorities are amongst racial, racial minorities. And we know that they make up about 5% of the population. Um, and I think what you know we're seeing is that we have uh, our, our frontline essential service people, uh, workers are disproportionately represented by racial minorities. So people working in food processing plants, grocery stores, um, taking care of people in group homes and long-term care. So they are, you know, they're really some of the heroes that are going to work every day and where you cannot completely socially distanced, put your, and put your mask on. I've got a Jill Mcgowan mask, by the way. So it's beautiful. I've never been known as a fashion Island. statement till now, but uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, she's got them for sale online. So as do other companies, but the, um, so I think that, you know, you look at the, the people who aren't able to mask telecommute, don't have benefits enough that they can take PTO or stay at home very well. And they are really some of our heroes working day after day, taking care of all of the rest of us, all of us. Um, and yet they've been disproportionately um, impacted by this disease. They're disproportionately getting infected um, because of the work that they're doing. And we're also seeing them hospitalized disproportionately. Um, a disproportionate high number of our hospitalizations, for instance, at Maine Medical Center um, are amongst our racial minorities. And that is because of some of the work that they're doing, but also they tend to um, have higher rates of some of the chronic diseases because they aren't able to get the good health care that many of us um, have access to. And so they have higher rates of chronic diseases that make them at higher risk for severe COVID. And um, it just breaks my heart. So that's one of the things that um, has really been striking in relief, both across the country and here in Maine. And it's racial disparities as well as income disparities that right. we're really seeing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dora. Tony, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on this. All right. You know, the thing that I'm struck by, um, and I, I don't think there's really much of our community uh, that has not experienced the, the fallout is cash flow. To me, that is what has really uh, mm -hmm. come stark, stark relief because um, we don't have adequate savings as individuals uh, or often as governments uh, either in order to cope with this kind of a, uh, of a challenge. I've been incredibly impressed by the state, uh, by the entire Mills family. Uh, and 
the quality oh of the God, community. Are you related to some, some <laughs> poor people? You're, you're kind of, it feels like sometimes on Facebook you're in a minority. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and obviously, Dr. Shah as well, who has been just a support of providing a good steady flow of, of technical and scientific information. Yeah. But what I'm most concerned about, honestly, is as we take a look at the challenges facing municipalities, is making sure that um, the, I hope what could be a hiccup, but uh, may in fact be something more sustained, is the lack of uh, cash flow around property taxes, excise taxes, and other um, uh, centers of revenue. And those challenges are gonna come into very stark relief as we move forward. So I'm gonna to try to frame my remarks um, around that today because um, the hat that I wear also is a former town councilor, but uh, also a member of the business community. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Yeah, we have a lot of elected officials and managers and staff uh, today from our cities and towns, as well as um, staff from social services and transit agencies here. And I think everybody is uh, feel feeling this incredible pinch on cash flow. So thanks for putting that forward. So there are some bright spots that we're seeing um, as people innovate and change their lifestyles. So my next question for all of you is what do we not want to go back to normal? I would throw in commuting. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, we polled our own folks at uh, Memic um, and their, um, their satisfaction with working from home, we had a whopping 96% say that they are very satisfied or somewhat satisfied with working from home. And I suspect that that echoes across uh, all of the jobs that can be done at a distance um, and courtesy of, of a high-speed internet. But that to me is probably one of the benefits as well in terms of the load on our infrastructure. If you think about uh, traffic, um, one of the greatest challenges that we had been uh, facing is uh, back to probably 1980s levels. Um, and certainly Peter Mills has, uh, is struggling with about 50% of the traffic on the turnpike that uh, they have in recent uh, months. Yeah. So let's stay on that point for just a second on the, I call it e-living, telework, telemedicine, you know, e remote schooling. And let's, let's uh, we know it's got climate benefits, Hannah. Um, and we know that it has employee satisfaction. It might actually save employers some money also if everybody doesn't go back to their office spaces. I'm um, just wondering what your thoughts are about how we might lock in some of the remote work um, culture shift. No, I mean, I don't think anyone thought we could go remote so fast. And of course, it was a rather hiccupy for the first uh, last couple of weeks of March, but then people seem to ease into it with um, remarkably few hiccups after that in April and May. So what are your thoughts about how we can, how we can sustain some of the reductions in commuting and, and reductions in emissions? I think some of that takes on its own gravity based on its usefulness. So, you know, Maine has been relatively slow to adopt telehealth um, relative to some more urban markets. And what we've seen in this period is that even small clinics are deploying telehealth solutions. Um, and so, you can imagine that, you know, frankly, consumer consumer delight with the ability to be able to take a 20 minute appointment in 20 minutes since that is in three hours, um, you know, sort of drives the drives the, the inherent stickiness of it. I, I think what's much less clear is the stickiness of um, distance education. Um, you know, that's that's much newer. It's not polished. We're learning. Our teachers are learning. Our administrators are learning. Our students are learning. And there's lots of things we don't like about it. And we don't know yet if those are things that have to do with our learning curve or sort of the inherent limitations of the technology itself. And so I, I, I suspect that that'll be a, a relatively transient phenomenon, but, uh, but, I, but I think telework and telehealth are here to stay. Just to, I mean, really agree with everybody else. I think Josh and I are both, and as are some of you elementary school parents, I, I would certainly say for my seven-year-old, uh, long-term distance learning is is not for working parents or for seven-year-olds. Um, I, I do think there are some opportunities in education, and I think the Rue Institute and others, as well as some of our higher education systems, are, are experimenting with this. I think we know that it's not equal to a four-year college education, and you're going to miss out on a lot, but there may be opportunities for sort of these 
uh, smaller job training, of which Maine needs a lot. We're going to have, especially even the next couple of years, workforce transi transitions that are going to require retraining that online distance learning may really be able to accommodate. Um, I mean, I would say just totally echoing Tony, I, the state has just done a large survey of state employees. And while again, it's not for everyone, um, it is something that is working well for many state employees and whether or not people go totally remote, that's probably not most employees, but could most of us be working from home a couple days a week? Uh, the state would reduce significant vehicle miles traveled from an emissions perspective. As we think about renovating state office buildings, it, you know, it totally changes the picture. And I know a lot of private companies are experimenting with the whole same thing. Um, I and mean, actually, even to bring up a point Josh made, um, I've heard him make this previously. I mean, we have companies in, um, nationally, uh, like Facebook and Twitter, that are moving their entire workforces to remote forever. So could that really be a change for the state of Maine in terms of people we could recruit to move here? We need a younger demographic. Um, we don't just need all remote workers. We need people in all kinds of fields in our state, but we certainly need young people. We need kids. Um, so it is actually an opportunity for Maine. As we know, we have a great quality of life. Um, so th those are some things that we don't want to go back to, and there are also opportunities. I think that's right. But but as we think about what is local and what's remote, if work is remote, we want the people to live here and work yes. remotely. And and so as we just think about like what kind of investments do we want to make in our communities, we think about quality of place kind of investments, um, public health and social service kind of investments. Like what do we need to do to support people here? And then to the extent that those people are going to work in high paying jobs that are somewhere else, potentially, we also need to invest in education. And so, I, you know, I think we may be entering a time period where we need to just be very thoughtful about how we think about where those investments go, because ultimately we're talking about competing more for population and educated population and being able to educate that population than we are necessarily just for the location of a corporate headquarters, which is, you know, certain, it's not not true, but it's less true than it was, you know, three months ago, for sure. You know, one of the, the terms that I've uh, coined is, is that work is uh, an activity, it's not a place. And if you think about it that way, um, you know, as we have at Memic, we've been thinking, you know, right now we've got the opportunity to have an entire nation uh, or globe for our, our marketplace for new employees, um, given the fact that we have done the, all of this seamlessly. So we've seen some people trying to kind of leave hot spots. Uh, I was just gonna say here. that, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and we, we think a lot at GPCOG about population and demographic trends, and we've been thinking about climate change as well, and what that means since Maine tends to be a little bit safer, more climate safe than other places, and perhaps we're more pandemic safe also. So I just wonder, are you guys bullish on Maine for getting people here? I think it's a great, a great way to market it, that we are less dense. And that's uh, is now, I think a few months ago, that wouldn't necessarily been something we would have promoted. It, you know, we promote our beauty. Um, but my goodness, um, we now we're less dense and people want it. I know of anecdotally, I know of two families um, from New York City who contacted me in just the last few days looking for realtor, wanting to buy property and move up here with their kids. I'm like, please come. Um, and I think along those lines of the, of the telecommuting, um, as you mentioned, uh, telehealth, telemedicine. So the months leading up to the pandemic at Maine Health, uh, we were um, basically conducting about a thousand telehealth visits per month. We were in the planning stages. We've been planning for a couple of years. We have some staff planning to turn the dials up um, and we uh, but we had basically a couple of speech therapists and a psychiatrist who were doing most of our vast majority of our telehealth visits uh, we are now doing not a thousand we're doing almost 20,000 a month so and you know and, and part of it yes we had to pivot like everybody else did but um, we had regulations, as Hannah and others know, there were suddenly all these federal and state regulations that were in the way, mostly federal regulations, and the payment system. We didn't have parity. Um, we still don't quite have parity yet for telehealth visits in most cases, but, um, but we were able to, there were some of the regulations that were a hindrance um, were lifted, and we hope that they stay lifted because this was um, tremendous. And we have, were doing surveys of all of our patients were doing um, telehealth 
with ANA providers, over 90% of both the patients and the providers say, keep it up. We like it. It was a great experience. I had my first telehealth visit myself as a patient last week. And I, I thought, wow, like it just saved me two and a half hours. You know, it was a 10 minute visit I had and I could see my doctor. It was great. We had a nice conversation. We had everything done. I thought, wow, that could, you know, I would have taken two to two and a half hours off from work just to go to that visit drive, sit in a waiting room, you know, the routine, right? And instead, I, you know, got an email to come into a, uh, a, some kind of waiting room, you know, it's just like, a, but you, know, you wait in the waiting room, and then she comes on the screen when it's your turn. So it, it was wonderful. And I thought, well, this is great. So, um, so I think telehealth is, uh, is really something we want to keep but as Josh <laughs> mentions that, you know, with the broadband, we do need to have the, you know, at least the bandwidth across the state to be able to continue it at this, um, at this amount. And I should just also mention, well, I've got the mic here, sort of um, anecdotally across the country. I haven't seen published data on this yet, but we've seen it in Maine, too. I've been in touch with all the other three health systems. We're all seeing dramatic reductions in asthma, um, heart disease, um, admissions coming into the emergency room. You know, and at first we thought, well, it's just because everybody's holed up in their cave at home. Um, but now that people are getting out, it's still down. And you got to think it's got to do with the pollution or, um, you know, but it, it warrants further examination to determine why, um, why we're seeing such reductions in some uh, disease, disease exacerbations of diseases in our hospitals and, and outpatient settings. And what is it that we can continue to keep that up? That's, that's great, Dora. Thank you so much. And that, you know, what's going on in telehealth is really teeing up my next big question for all of you, which is around innovation. And what is it that we need to innovate more rapidly on or really focus our innovation on that we've learned from this pandemic? And Dora, I'm gonna go quickly back to you just to talk about public health infrastructure and what are some of the longer term changes that we need to put in place from a public health perspective to protect us from maybe a second wave of COVID or future waves of COVID and maybe even future pandemics? Yeah, I mean, we certainly, as um, probably a lot of people are aware, we've really had a um, reduction in our public health infrastructure the last few years across the country and in here in Maine. Um, and we're, you know, I think Nirav Shah, one of my heroes, he's trying to build it back up. Um, but it's, you know, it's, uh, as Governor Baldacci used to say, it's a mile into the woods, it's a mile out. So we've been a mile into the woods and we're trying to hurry back out um, and we don't have a mile of time to get back out. We need that public health infrastructure across our state and across our country because you know I, I say this is we're only in the second chapter of this pandemic this is with us for a while this is not a one and done um, we don't have hurt we're not even close to herd immunity so um, this is with us for the time being um, we have to get used to the masking and the social distancing it's just the, it's the tools we have um, but we this is a public health threat that's going to be with us for a while maybe a, a couple of years or so, we don't know. Um, but this is chapter two, because chapter one was flattening the curve. And I call chapter two that we're in right now is coexisting with COVID. So we're all trying to figure out, we've got COVID patients at Maine Med. We've got quite a few actually. And we're also, we've got them in certain ward. We're trying to figure out how do we also um, see our other patients. And so we're all trying to coexist. We're trying to figure out how do we go down, walk down the street and coexist the fact that there are people with COVID walking by. Um, or we might have COVID, we just don't know it. So, but the public health infrastructure is something that we need to have across our state. And I know the state is working very hard on that, but I think we've learned that and hopefully someday we'll be able to use it to get vaccine out there as well. Great. And Tony, I'm gonna to turn to you next and then you and jo uh, Josh and Hannah um, about the innovations that we need for economic development. And Tony, ask to just have you reflect as um, you know, chair of uh, the advocacy committee of the chamber, we've had like kind of whiplash on workforce issues, right? We had a worker shortage and now we have really high unemployment. Um, and we've seen that our economy is, um, it's vulnerable, you know, and it's, it's more vulnerable than many other states because of our high dependence on tourism and uh, the age of our workforce, et cetera. I'm wondering if you could talk about how you think we need to start shaping our economy in the region. And then Josh and Hannah, I'm gonna ask you to reflect on at the state level, 
through the Governor's Economic Recovery Committee, I'm going to ask you the same question at the state level. But Tony, let's kick it off with you at the regional. Thanks. You know, it's funny, if you really take a look at the found foundational number, uh, we're still the oldest state in the nation. And in some ways, it's interesting, again, for municipalities, is that with that number of people who are on fixed incomes, still paying their property taxes, still doing their daily living because they provided for themselves, um, that's good news in terms of the potential of um, uh, you know, not being in crisis, which is good. Uh, but for recruiting new people to the workforce, I mean, again, we are uh, aging out our workforce incredibly quickly, including municipalities, which I know is, is a, a real challenge, trying to draw people into uh, municipal administration as well as state um, uh, employment. So with that, we continue to need to recruit and we need to do so strategically. And as Josh pointed up, um, particularly, we've got a state that is incredibly accepting. Uh, we are accessible, um, and but for some infrastructure issues around uh, getting connectivity um, to high-speed world standards, um, we can bring in the kind of workforce that we need in order to replace those who are retiring. But and to that end, again, making this very uh, pertinent to the municipal uh, governments, whatever you can do in, in terms of introducing 5G, for instance, with the, um, and I don't know the technology, but um, the, the substations that can be put onto uh, public utility poles, whatever it takes in order to make sure that municipalities are doing their uh, role in making sure that we have high speed internet everywhere is gonna make a big difference. That's great, thanks, Tony. Hannah? Sure. I mean, it's it's a great question, and, and there's sort of a whole bunch of angles. I mean, even the climate and energy angle is is relevant. Um, I would say I was just had a conversation with Andy Pershing, who's uh, the chief scientist at Gulf of Maine uh, Marine Institute, thinking about climate issues and sort of how we rethink and reimagine. And the hard thing about the recession we are in and that is likely to get worse is that it really is going to change industries in fundamental ways. And in, in some ways, you know, this, he used the word, the, we're wiping the slate clean. And I, I certainly hope that we don't wipe any of slates of our economy entirely clean, but there will be a lot of rebuilding that needs to happen. And the word, I think that Cuomo started it and the governor has been using it, but just the idea of how do we take this incredibly challenging period and use it to reimagine systems uh, for people that are better, both you know, job training systems, economic systems that are more resilient. There's certainly a lot of conversations like this about food systems. Uh, we've obviously been talking about broadband. Um, so I think as, as sort of bad as this is, how do we use it as a moment to figure out how to rebuild in a way that makes more sense for the long term? Same is certainly true for the resiliency of our communities and our economies. Um, energy systems, and we're really trying to think about it in that kind of way. Um, I mean, even all the conversation we just had about Mainers, um, about people considering moving to Maine because of this pandemic, I actually think that's a real uh, challenge and opportunity for groups like GP Cog in that we are going to see growth. And how do we manage that growth in a way that is not just sprawling and going to you know, contribute in greater ways to the state's challenges, but actually build communities um, and systems that are better functioning. Um, you know, that's a conversation among our climate council. We start talking about Maine and, and land use ordinances and everyone's, you know, I know you do a lot better in, in GP COG territory than some places like where I live, but these are really important conversations to have and probably going to require sort of a fast track of some of this planning and rethinking work. And uh, Hannah, for most groups, their eyes would glaze over when you say land use ordinance changes, but for us, at GB Cog and many people in the audience, their eyes would light up. <laughs> Good. I love it. I love a group full of like land use nerds. So <laughs> you've got them in this room, and you know that's a, that that uh, how do we accommodate new growth? I mean, I think sometimes in Maine we are kind of pessimistic about the future of growth because we've had such slow growth, but um, it, there is certainly the potential that we would have higher rates in the future. Uh, it's something that Tony and I, the chamber and GB Cog, we've been talking a lot about particularly in a place like the city of Portland, Westbrook, South Portland, uh, extremely desirable places for younger people. And then we've got some fantastic suburbs and we've got the Lakes region. I mean, it's just a beautiful place to, um, to come as a young person and then to raise a family. So um, Josh, can you talk a little bit too about your role as a co-chair of the Governor's Recovery Council? 
Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to turn to you for a second question around digital access. Okay, so in the, in the Economic Recovery Committee, we're focused on how to get the state back on track to its 10-year plan after the reopening happens. And, you know, so that's the first distinction is our, our work in some ways begins as the reopening um, plan completes. And ultimately, I don't think anyone knows exactly what the path will be towards, you know, full reopening because the situation with the virus is evolving in real time. But we have to consider a range of possibilities of what that could wind up being. And then also acknowledge that whether we're open or not, and, and once we're reopened, um, businesses uh, and different sectors will still have challenges to wrestle with on how they work in this, as, as uh, Dora explained, the, the living with COVID phase, right? That living with COVID phase probably bridges various phases of the reopening. And so we've divided our task into two core pieces. Um, the first is to stabilize and support. This is to make a rapid assessment of the sectors that we're evaluating to see um, what immediate help um, that those sectors need so that they, they can survive the, the dip here in the bottoming and be there to enjoy the growth during the recovery period, um, right? We're not just focusing on what happens in a year or two. Uh, and then uh, the second phase would be to build a bridge between wherever we wind up at the bottom of the economic crisis uh, to get back on track with what we imagined in our 10-year economic plan. I think we're obviously in a very different starting point than we were before, but we still have some high aspirations. And so we've tried to stake out our work in, in between this sort of emergency management role to figure out when it's safe to be in different places and when we're back into a sort of managing economic development um, in, in a more business as usual kind of way once the recovery uh, has a full head of steam. And I, I've been just super impressed by the, uh, the people who are on the committee from all over the state in all different industries and sectors. And I really appreciated the governor's foresight to say, look, while we're managing this crisis, we have to make sure somebody's keeping their eye on the ball of what happens during this recovery period and, and especially making sure that we're ready to respond to whatever stimulus opportunities you know, may come down the, the pike in the recovery period. Great, thanks so much, Josh. Um, turning to broadband, we've talked about that a lot already. And I just wanted to ask you what you think Mainers need to do in order to support, and this region needs to do in order to support more broadband access. So I, I think the first and most important thing is to have a really high aspiration for what broadband means. Um, I, th I think for a number of years, it's been easy to settle. And um, that's left us in a place where, you know, kind of like broadband that's just good enough all of a sudden under heavier uses is, is really not good at it, and certainly not what it's like in other bigger metro areas. Um, tactically, I think the first thing people can do is get out to vote in July uh, and support the referendum on broadband. Um, I think that's probably going to be a very popular uh, initiative and for good reason. The idea is that um, the state can provide some modest support for areas that don't have broadband and make a big difference. It's a big lever on those communities because behind the broadband investment is all those other things we talked about, education, work, health, um, are, are all delivered through that medium. So it's a very small investment for a, a, a very large return. I, I think more broadly, once, once we've set sort of a higher aspirational target for what broadband is, like really fast speeds, gigabit and more speeds, mm -hmm. um, then uh, we need to, to set about the business of building it. And, and I think at that point, it's a bit more complicated and we need to do some planning. And, and one of the things that the, Connect Maine Authority has done a good job here in the state of Maine is to provide some support, technical assistance support for planning and not just for infrastructure. Sometimes that's a shortcoming in infrastructure programs is that there's not good planning. I'm sure, sure planning is near and dear to everybody's heart here. Uh, and, and so I, I think those are some methods of support in Maine that we could probably scale and, and, and deploy in areas that we didn't think of as unserved. But if I'm unserved on the West End in Portland, then everybody's unserved here. Great, right. thanks, Josh. Um, Hannah, as promised, we're going to go back to climate for a moment because Josh mentioned that the economic plan, it might, we might have to like take a few steps back to get back on track and it's one of the priorities that the, of the Mills administration and then also climate is. And Tom, I'm going to ask you to share the screen for a second with one of my favorite cartoons that I've seen recently from The Economist. Um, this shows uh, the earth. Uh, fighting with COVID in the ring, and outside is the larger guy, climate change, who's waiting to get in the ring. 
um, against Earth. And to me, this just uh, indicated again, like how we've got this pandemic, but we have all these other things we're trying to achieve, whether it's economic development, whether it's reducing opioid misuse, or whether it's climate change. Uh, you could take that down, Tom. And I was just wondering, climate uh, on climate, Hannah, I've been watching the Climate Council very closely, part of one of the working groups, been impressed that you haven't missed a beat despite the pandemic. All that work has continued full steam ahead. And, um, but it's going to be a real challenge to try to implement the recommendations that are coming out of the Climate Council, given the reduction in state revenues, what's happening with municipal revenues, uh, and yet it's obviously something that we as a state need to face. Can you just share what your thinking is right now about how that ranks among the priorities for the Mills administration and, and what we need to be doing to be thinking about, you know, I guess, walking and chewing gum at the same time? Yeah, I mean, you explained and described it well, Christina. I mean, I would say that we, um, Christina, among others, and I'm sure there's others on this on this call um, who are members of the Climate Council. That the Climate Council had 30 working group mem 30 working group meetings in the 30 work days of of April. So people, I, I mean, I'm amazed by the commitment. I think a lot of people have felt this is sort of one of the existential significant issues of our time. And despite the crisis we're in, we have to keep planning for the, the other crisis that is coming and is already with us as well in other ways. Um, and people have been incredibly committed and focused. And I, and I don't think um, it has, cer certainly the governor spends her time mostly focused on COVID and, and sort of the current challenges in front of us. Um, but she's incredibly supportive of this um, work to continue to plan for climate um, the Climate Action Plan, which is still due December 1, and we are on track to deliver that, and it is still among her top priorities. Um, certainly, uh, we have shifted online. We have a big meeting coming up in June where the working groups deliver their um, solutions, their, their suggestions to the Climate Council. Um, we're going to spend the summer doing public engagement, and clearly that has changed. We were planning many large group meetings, and we are now um, planning a, a virtual um, process with some in person because we know many people are not on the internet and we want to make sure that it is um, broad. Um, I will just say like when I think about climate it really is for Maine there are opportunities and economic opportunities um, for a wood product sector, for our marine economy, um, you know for, for plants that are building, um, you know looking at insulation, for thinking about broadband, there's, there's so much overlap with our ability to grow our economy and manage for um, a more uh, more resilient community. So I think it's it clearly um, is going to change the way we look at funding. Um, I think some climate solutions, I mean, you still see many people planning and implementing solar, for example, because it's gonna save a municipality or save a business um, funds. And so I think as people are starting to see the opportunities um, in, in green energy, I, I think it's still, that will still continue. Um, I think Tony's earlier points about access to capital and, and how do we fund all kinds of systems for both our state and for businesses, it probably will be more challenging. Um, we certainly saw in 2009 um, a major focus on um, a clean energy economy as part of the economic recovery uh, during uh, the Obama era. And we certainly hope when we've talked to members of Congress, um, I know there are folks who are focused on how do we make this recovery a green recovery? How do we make it so that we can build better energy systems, weatherize people's homes um, in ways that, that allow for, for longer term stability in our communities? So I, I think it is possible, but is it going to be challenging? Certainly, do we need to be more focused on really the economic benefits and uh, that, that needs to be our focus because I think clearly people are going to be in a different mood. They're going to be feeling different in their own families and their own um, communities and their own businesses. So we need to approach it carefully, but we obviously feel like it's incredibly important to stay focused and, and push hard as, as hard as we can. Thanks, Hannah. Dora, <coughs> I'm gonna turn to you next. And I've got two questions left that I'm hoping all four of you can answer. Um, so my, my first question for you is what kind of advice you might have for the decision makers that are in the room. As I said before, we have a lot of staff and elected officials who are making you know day-to-day -day decisions that are affecting our residents. And um, at COG, as we think about the future, there, there are things that we know, there are things that we don't know, and then there are things that we think we know, but we don't actually know. And those are the most dangerous ones, right? So we're living in this really incredible period of uncertainty. And I'm just wondering in general, all of you being leaders, what do you think 
our municipal leaders should be thinking about as they make decisions in this time of uncertainty? Well, I'll say in terms of the pandemic, there's three things that I hope you could help us with. And I say us, I mean, healthcare, anybody interested in, in public health, the, if you could help us change the culture around masking, social distancing, and hygiene, hand hygiene particularly, um, I just, it, it, uh, those are the tools we have. As much as there's in the news about maybe a vaccine and there's this drug and that drug, none of these drugs right now are that effective, if effective at all. Some of them even may cause more harm, actually. And the vaccine, you know, it, it, it's at least months away, um, at least months away. So, and, and months more that we can actually get it enough manufactured and distributed. So uh, right now, the tools we have are masking, and social distancing, the six feet apart, and washing our hands when you touch common surfaces. Sing happy birthday as we wash Sing our happy hands, happy birthday. Right? I've got my, my, this is a split rock distillery made um, a bunch of this uh, hand sanitizer for us at Maine Health. So we each have these at our desk, um, locally made, which is very nice. Talk about pivoting. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, that, that is, those are the tools we have. And we know more and more about how this is spread and how it's not, so not, not spread. And those are the three major tools that are clearer and clearer that strategies that we need to implement. Um, and yet, you know, even in Portland where there's quite, I think probably a lot more acceptance of that, but you still see a lot of people, you know, see people were crowded in and not wearing masks and all that. And yeah, I go out at Back Cove. I'll just answer this quick because I get this all the time. So I do walk around Back Cove a lot. I try to go when it's less dense because I cannot wear a mask around all of Back Cove, particularly now that it's it's warm. So, um, and, and really the, I, it's probably not transmitted by, you know, somebody running by if they're a few feet away. I, but anyway, I'm just, say that because but because somebody will see me at back cove and say well she didn't have a mask on when she was walking on back cove so i just want to say and i do if it's crowded i have one on like this and i'll put it up when i you know passing people or actually they're mostly passing me what am i talking about so <laughs> so but I, mean, I don't think i passed anybody in a long time on back cove. <laughs> so, uh, okay other thoughts on um on this question of advice or requests that you might have of our municipal officials and our agency leaders uh, echoing what uh, Dora said, I, I think looking after public safety, uh, and, and today that includes the public health, has been really critical to our success to continue to operate. So, you know, we operate all over the country, um, and uh, because there hasn't been clear national guidance on what to do, we've had to rely on a web of state and local authorities um, to provide guidance on both what's permissible and what's prudent. And Interestingly, even in places where states have been um, a bit flip about uh, the risks involved, local jurisdictions have stepped in and filled the gap. So think about places like the suburbs of Atlanta, where Georgia is kind of wide open right now, but municipalities are stepping in with civil orders and, and different guidance. You know, ultimately, municipal authorities are the closest to people and in some ways are the most trusted people in our life. We, we rarely hear a heavy hand or a voice about what we can do and not do um, from municipal government. And so in the rare instance when it's there, I, I think it, it's a very loud and clear voice. And so from my standpoint, we're continuing to operate. Our, our workers are considered essential workers. So they're um, you know, out, out doing their work outdoors, but their safety is actually um, guaranteed by you know, lower density on the streetscape and you know, keeping, keeping some semblance of control. I think the other thing is and, and there's some, some unintended consequences around sort of the loosening of um, sort of the normal strictures of, um, you know, enforcement around laws and ordinances during this time. Parking especially comes to mind. One of the unintended consequences of uh, the lack of parking enforcement has been the access that comes from parking enforcement for construction projects and other essential services. And so something to consider is what, even if you want to relax the, the sort of framework of parking, what, what things could we still keep in place like, you know, emergency, uh, no parking areas and that sort of thing that would still continue to function. Great. Thanks, Josh. Tony and Hannah, I'm going to ask you to be pithy on this, on this one. Let me take a, my, my crack at it. There's a trifecta that um, 
we've talked about, which is uh, land use planning and development. Um, as, the, as we transition, <clears throat> really the, the charge hasn't changed other than the opportunity of new people coming to us. And I look forward and, and think that the commercial spaces that currently may be in office or retail use um, may in fact no longer be as necessary for us and could easily be con converted, I shouldn't say easily, <clears throat> but could be converted into housing in much more dense populations. You know, my, my good friend, Alan Karen, uh, took me to school on the issues of smart growth. And smart growth really, I think, needs to be the byword of what we're facing uh, for the state of Maine. The other thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing that it does is it stops emissions. And that's, you know, again, I think Hannah's um, sensitivity about let's stop the emissions because that's a huge de degradation to the environment has to be very in the forefront. And the final thing I'll say is, is my pitch from, uh, from Memic is that as we continue to work from home, um, we need to work safely. Um, mm -hmm. It's a workplace. Uh, and as I said early on, work is, is an activity, not a place, but the fact that you do it from someplace that's not uh, usual, um, that means make sure your, your, your office setup is, is fine and that uh, you're acting prudently to avoid injury. Thanks, Tony. Anna? Great, Tony. I'm glad you can't see where I'm sitting because you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> Too. <laughs> uh, I, guess I, I will just say very briefly. I think um, I've been working on some of the the um, economic development challenges of reopening the state. Clearly, we're working on climate and every single issue. Um, the partnership with municipalities and cities. Um, is so key. I mean, the governor just this morning was talking to some southern Maine beach towns about how do we safely manage um, the, the tourism that has already come, started coming to Maine this past weekend. Um, and it really is a lot about how do we engage smart uh, municipal leaders um, and, and people you know, on the ground and businesses in, in those kind of approaches. And the same is certainly true on climate. The state is under-resourced. We don't have a lot of staff and a lot of it is gonna be about working in partnership with communities around making smart decisions, planning more proactively and figuring out how to implement um, the state's goals, which I think many of our communities and, and, and people in Maine share. So really, again, thank you for, for what everybody in this call is doing is gonna help us do um, during this increasingly challenging time. We are going to end with a question that Josh suggested to the panelists in our prep work. Um, it's a rapid fire question for you guys. So just a couple words. And my question to you is, since the start of the pandemic, what have you come to appreciate more? And Josh, I know you're ready to answer this, so we'll go to you first, but you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I've come to really appreciate what it's like to live in Maine and be in a place where we can pull together and participate in a, in a, in a bipartisan, multi-community, you know, Mainers versus the disease kind of way, uh, which, you know, I, I deeply, deeply appreciate. And I, I think, you know, there's a lot of resilience in our ability to solve problems together in kind of a, a, a rational and, and common sense way. Thanks. The rapid fire continues. Tony. <clears throat> I, this sounds you know, like I'm sucking up to everybody on this call. I am so grateful for quality leadership. Um, and from the governor's office straight on through to our municipalities, we're very, very fortunate. The voters have sent such quality people, not only as elected officials, but also to be hired as professional staff. And you're all doing a great job. That's lovely, Tony. Thank you. Dora? So many. Um, I would just say my two young adult kids who are home with, were crowded into a two bedroom condo and it's been, um, but it's been one of these very special times um, also that we're playing cards and they're learning how to cook. I don't know how many banana breads we've made, but <laughs> way too many. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's been, I think it's a time that even though there's a lot of sadness um, and we've known people who've died and so there's a lot of sadness, but there's also that the preciousness that I think um, I'm going to hold on to as well. And I think they, I hope they will too. Thanks, Dora. Hannah? Um, really, people have said it well, I, and thank you, Tony. Um, I would say, I mean, I live in a very small town and I've kind of missed my friends and neighbors and I think we're all missing sort of that social interaction and, and trying to figure out ways to do it in safe ways. Um, I, I think I feel very, very lucky to live in Maine. It's such a beautiful place.
place. I think we've all had a chance to find ways to get outside and sort of feel very lucky to be sort of have that freedom in, in ways that, you know, certainly folks in New York City and other places around the country, certainly other parts of the world have, have not been able to enjoy during this challenging period. So I think the nature and the place that is Maine, it's sort of given us greater value, which, which is important for a lot of our future work. Thank you. That's a wonderful note to end on. And one of the sad things about Zoom is that you can't hear applause. I have a feeling that our 100 plus attendees would be applauding very much right now for your time um, and for your insights. It was a great thing to hear from all of you and it gives me hope um, that we're going to be moving in the right direction as a region and a state. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you also to all of you for your leadership in the public health community, in the public sector, and the private sector. Um, we, we are stronger, all of us together, as we work this through. So thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you, you, Christina. Thanks, Thanks everybody. So thank thank you. you. And Christina, thank you to GP Cog. And your yes. It's been terrific. Well, we have some fabulous members, as you noticed, and we also have a great team of staff. And so um, it's just it's, it's a pleasure to work with all of you in the region. You guys have been great. Keep and, it up. and hopefully sometime soon at this back at the stone house. Back at the stone house <laughs> with our cocktails and our beautiful hors d'oeuvres <laughs> produced by local farmers. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. Thank you. So our